Welcome back. Welcome back to our second session on piercing the corporate veil. Now, before we move forward, let's just go back to what we've covered. And I'll actually put this a little higher so you can see it. What are the factors that will lead a court to pierce the corporate veil? Now, remember, of course, that the corporate veil is this concept that shareholders enjoy limited liability. They don't enjoy limited liability in unlimited circumstances, however. It's sort of a gift, the limited liability. It's meant to improve the economy, to encourage investment. But it can create some room for some uh, misdeeds, if you will. Sorry, I'll get my sound here. It can create some room for some, some bad action. And so we have the veil piercing doctrine as an equitable backstop to the corporate law. So it's, it's not in the corporate law. It's something that the courts have developed over time to try to make the situation more fair because corporations externalize a lot of their risks onto society. Some of those risks, okay, that's fair. Some of those risks, not fair. So what are some features or factors that will lead a court to choose to pierce or not to pierce? Well, I have them up here. So our number one factor is the corporate structure of all, the, the general corporate governance. On one end of the ledger, uh, one end of the, of the balance beam are large public companies or just public companies. Publicly traded corporations are never pierced, ever. And that sort of makes sense because, as we'll see, the other features that would exist uh, also, uh, also are not there. Just weren't sure who you were today, Courtney, so you turned your name tag around. Now, now private companies could be pierced. But some private companies are actually widely held, and you don't have this conflation of ownership and control as you would in a closely held corporation, meaning just a few shareholders. And finally, I've added this to the list today as I was thinking about it, we have our, our situations where we have a sole shareholder. The vast majority of piercing cases involve a sole shareholder, and the remainder involve a closely held company. There's almost no piercing of private companies, and there's never piercing of public companies. So you could think of this as a factor, but really, this is a limiting factor. I mean, if you have a public company, the rest of the analysis, it will add up to no piercing, at least unless this is the exceptional case that is beyond uh, even my ability to make a hypothetical about. Which, granted, is not that great. But the next factor, the number one factor that is found, the factor that's found most often in piercing, courts are most willing to pierce when you have then a company that has the right structure and there is a misrepresentation. And this may be why we find that there is piercing in contracts more than in torts. You don't really have the chance to misrepres misrepresent that you're going to run somebody over, right? And say, oh, I promised to run you over with a truck, and I only hit you with a Camry, you know? No, this is usually a misrepresentation of a contract, that uh, the contract, we're going to pay you for five years, we pay you for two. And so misrepresentation is the number one factor, and that might start us to lead to understand why piercing is more frequent in contracts cases than in torts cases, even though it's counterintuitive since you might think that contract claimants are assuming the risk of engaging with a company. Well, they're not assuming the risk of being lied to. Next, we have commingling of assets. And this goes to the alter ego doctrine. When a company has management or a sole shareholder more likely that treats the company as their own personal piggy bank. This goes to the domination and control element that we see down there. But in studies, the second most common factor, aside from corporate structure, which is more of a limiting factor, but the kind of on the scale, uh, commingling of assets will lead courts to pierce. And this may lead us to pierce in torts cases as well. So while we don't pierce as frequently, there is piercing in torts cases. And if you're treating the company as your own piggy bank and you run someone over with the cab that you own, you might pay out of your own pockets. You sort of lose the ability to separate your assets when you haven't been doing that all along. Our third factor would be undercapitalization. Not minimal capitalization, but undercapitalization. When the company does not have enough assets where it's being drained of its assets. This is not as, as bad as commingling assets. Commingling assets is when you treat the company like your own personal piggy bank and you disregard even having separate bank accounts. Money that should be going to the corporation goes directly to your pocket. This is not quite as severe when you have a case of undercapitalization, but you're using the right process, you have separate accounts, but every chance you get, you're withdrawing all the money from the company, and you're really doing it intentionally in order to prevent people from having a successful suit against you. Yeah. And then our fourth most common factor, uh, which is sort of a head scratch, your failure to observe formalities. Why does that matter? I mean, 
on the side of the tort claimant, honestly, the tort claimant doesn't really know or care whether or not you had an annual meeting. Right? That's not relevant. But it seems that courts are playing a little tit for tat in that if you don't observe corporate formalities and you don't observe the rules of corporate law, corpor uh, courts are going to be less willing to give you the benefits of corporate law, although that is our fourth most common factor. Now, those factors are captured a bit, and I'm, I'm just put these down here, and maybe I could even draw kind of a, a dotted line a little bit, because in a sense, some of these are, are restatements, but we also see a couple other features, if you want to think about them, that come up in our cases. One is the idea of domination or control. And so we generally only have, this is actually part of the alter ego doctrine, as we'll see as we review that doctrine today. Uh, but domination and control is really only possible when you have a small group or one shareholder. A very large group of people would not, who have various interests, some of which you might want to run a company to make money, right, and not as their own personal piggy bank, would not have the ability to dominate and control. Uh, another factor uh, that comes up is whether or not the shareholder made personal guarantees. And that's interesting because the personal guarantees themselves should give some recourse, right? And so maybe what we're seeing in those cases is those personal guarantees show that there should be recourse and we can, we can pierce because those guarantees, maybe they're not uh, contractually valid, but they were promised and they seem like misrepresentation. And finally, whether it's a tort or a contract claim is not a factor in the same kind of senses, but in general, we do find piercing more in contracts case than in torts cases. And so it really merits some consideration as to why we find piercing more commonly in contracts cases and torts cases. So it's not a factor per se, but I think it has to do with one of our factors, misrepresentation. We don't have the opportunity to misrepresent in advance of a tort. Torts are involuntary, right? Or, or a tort feeser, uh, the relationship with the tort victim is an involuntary relationship, at least on the part of the victim. Right? You're not deliberately getting your motorcycle hit by a cement truck. At least most people are not. And so you're not in a position of being misrepresented to before you get hit by that truck. It just so happens when you get hit by the truck, if the truck is owned by a company which has a sole shareholder who's been treating it like his personal piggy bank, and it's undercapitalized so it doesn't have the resources to pay you, courts will be more likely to pierce. And so whether or not it's a tort or a contract is not dispositive, it lends itself to the other factors. And this is not, by the way, a rule of law. This comes from scholarly studies that have looked at when courts pierce and done some analysis. So we'll return to that at the end as we close the section, but let's now turn to Freeman versus complex computing and talk about when courts do pierce, because we actually haven't seen piercing happen yet. So I'll leave that up there for you. And we'll start here on, on this side of the ledger. We have two cases where there was uh, a claim for piercing in a contract setting. And on the, on the one hand, we have a case where there was piercing. And on the other hand, we have a case where, although the trial court would pierce, the appellate court reversed. So this must be a case that's somewhat close to the line. Reasonable courts can disagree. So these are very good cases then to see. What got us over the line here? What kept us behind the line here? So let's start by talking about Freeman versus Complex Computing Co. And quite frankly, the case is complex. So I'll go ahead and just explain the structure to you as you kind of follow along. And I, I think it is very helpful, by the way, in these cases to map it out the way that I've tried to do here. So what I'm, I'm doing is, is illustrating for you what I would suggest you do if you're presented with a question like this, because the structure really matters. So when Jason Glazier was in graduate school at Columbia University, he developed a software program that apparently was very valuable, and he wanted to license it. So a quick tidbit, if you develop software, you're a graduate student, the school usually owns it. If you develop any technology, it's actually one of the big benefits schools get from their PhD students. Uh, if you're a PhD student, you probably don't pay for your school. You might get a small stipend, whether or not you teach, you may work in a lab or produce something, but the intellectual property that you develop while you're a student is generally owned by the school. And schools have offices called technology transfer offices, which can license this technology. Now, schools rarely sell the technology. They rarely sell the patent or any of the underlying protections. They will license it. Um, there are a number of reasons why, beyond our scope here. But in any event, Columbia University was willing to license the software back to Glacier. Well, they were willing to license the software, but they weren't willing to license it to a corporation of which Glacier was an officer, director, or shareholder. Quite frankly, I have no idea why. That doesn't make any commercial sense. What do they care? 
What do they care? But they care, right? It's a university, it's a bureaucracy, they've got rules and procedures and hoops to jump through. And so it was 1997, it was 1993, I guess, when this was developed. So maybe at that point, Columbia University was not very versed in intellectual property technology transactions, right? So they might have had some rule on the books. And so to circumvent the rule, Glazier comes up with this very clever scheme. As my, uh, as my uh, professor uh, uh, liked to say, it was a scheme that was too clever by half. How is it too clever by half? Well, it turns out that the scheme didn't work. It was, in fact, a scheme, and there was a, it was too transparent. So Professor Baird would say it was too clever by half here. So what was the scheme? The scheme was that they were going to form... Uh, let's, let's go this way here. They're going to form a company called C3, and C3 will not be owned or operated by Glacier. In fact, it was owned by a friend who's not named in the case, but a close personal friend, and it was operated by a man named Seth Akabas, who's the president. And so Glacier is not an officer, he is not a shareholder, he's not a director. So why would he be involved? Well, he had this very interesting deal. He was an independent contractor, and under this independent contractor agreement, he had an option, he was paid for work that he provided, and he had an option to purchase all the stock for uh, $2,000. At any time, it's an unlimited option to purchase all the stock. So effectively, he was able to put himself at his discretion, he was able to sort of substitute these positions for 2000 bucks. So you see where we're leading with this. So, we have this structure, and I guess it's good enough for Columbia to give the license, and now the company begins operating. So they have this software, very good software, and it's valuable, and so they need to sell it. So we hire Daniel Freeman, and Daniel Freeman agrees to sell and license C3's computer products for a five-year term. And in return for his efforts, C3 will pay commissions on revenues over a 10-year period. It's a nice agreement for a Freeman. Uh, it also included provisions relating to his compensation if he were to be terminated. So we have this agreement now with C3 and Freeman. And we know that Glazier is like uh, his, oh, and I should also mention that uh, the, uh, the independent contractor was actually Glazier Inc., not Glazier himself. There are all kinds of reasons one might do this. Maybe he didn't want to have liability for his work that he was providing. Maybe there was some tax benefit, who knows. But he was the sole owner of Glacier Inc. And he did, in fact, control it. Uh, the question really comes down to whether or not he controlled C3. All right, let's see how that comes up. So in August of 1994, C3 and Thompson Investment Software enter into a licensing agreement where now Thompson is going to get exclusive sales rights. So I keep on putting my chalk down. I really should stop doing that. I'm not used to the blackboard thing. I'm having a little fun with it. All right, so Thompson now has an exclusive, which means that this is worthless. Daniel Freeman can no longer do any sales work because someone else has an exclusive right to sell and market the software, but he's still entitled to payments. He's still entitled to payments this period of time. This is a bad deal for C3. They didn't know, 2020 hindsight, it's a bad deal. When they were making it, they thought, great, we have Freeman. But now they've done much better than Freeman with Thompson Investment Software. And in fact, it seems like Freeman helped them get this contract with Thompson. So after this happens, uh, two months later, in fact, C3 terminated the agreement with Freeman and said they're also going to uh, uh, stop paying him in the following way. They're going to essentially liquidate the assets. So. In January 1995, Thompson hires Glazier as vice president. So this guy actually comes over. He becomes the vice president of Thompson. And Thompson and C3 enter into an asset purchase agreement. So by that, it means that Thompson is going to acquire all the assets of C3. It's very much like a merger. And so under an asset purchase agreement, it has actually a lot of advantages mergers don't have that you, can, uh, you don't assume generally some of the liabilities. And so 
they schedule, they actually list all the assets and liabilities that are going to be transferred in this asset purchase. And what are those liabilities? Well, I'll tell you what they're not. They're not the contract with Freeman. Thompson is not assuming the contract with Freeman, and so in this way, Freeman, his 10-year period is up a little early. He didn't get the deal he bargained for. And at the end of the day, the money is going to flow to Glacier. So Freeman files suit against C3 for breaching its agreement and seeks recovery beyond the limited liability of C3 because at this time, C3's assets are like 10 grand. Think about some factors here. 10 grand. And they owe this guy hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they just, they just had an asset sale. You sold all your stuff. And you have no money to pay your, to pay your debts? Someone's going to be annoyed about that. So Freeman filed suit against C3 for breach and sought recovery through the shield. He sought piercing due to Glazier's domination and control over the company. The district court found that C3 and Glazier need to arbitrate this under their agreement. And it ruled that Glazier was subject to the arbitration clause of the agreement. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned that. This licensing agreement had an arbitration clause. And I assume that Freeman thought that would benefit him. And, and generally, arbitration clauses often benefit a smaller party because arbitration is less expensive. And in litigation, you have these cost asymmetries. One party can simply grind the other one into dust if you have a really big party, really small party. I mean, you just don't have enough money to feed the fire, meaning pay our bills. So <clears throat> the question of whether or not this is going to be arbitrated might have real, that's a procedural question, but it might have real substantive consequences. So. The district court found that they needed to arbitrate and ruled that Glazier was subject to it because he did not merely dominate and control C3, but because he held the sole economic interest of any significance. Effectively saying that this relationship, this friend, this is nothing. There's no, that no money was, that there was no money here. Let's put a zero. So C3's money. I, I may, or what, maybe, it was two, maybe he was entitled to $2,000, but $2,000 is not a lot of money given what we're working with here. And so the real, the economic reality of this company was that because of this option, Glazier was able to become the owner very easily and he acted like the owner. So is Glazier an equitable owner of C3? Equitable ownership. Is he an equitable owner? What does the equitable ownership doctrine say? And can the corporate veil be pierced to this equitable owner? So we have two separate issues to deal with. Under New York law, the doctrine of equitable ownership applies. And the doctrine of equitable ownership states that a non-shareholder is the, or may be the equitable owner of a corporation where the non-shareholder, quote, exercises considerable authority over the corporation to the point of completely disregarding the corporate form and acting as though its assets are his alone to manage and distribute. Unsurprisingly, that's very similar to our veil piercing factors. Treating the company like his own, dominate, control, right? Not observing formalities, perhaps. And so we have that first doctrine. And so the court holds, the appellate court holds yes. Yes, in fact, Glazier was the equitable owner of C3 he effectively owned it. He was, uh, although the structure was different, and for whatever reason, the guys at Columbia University thought this was fine, and this was somehow different from what they were trying to avoid for whatever reason. It wasn't different. This was exactly like if Glacier was the friend, less $2,000. So he was the equitable owner. Now, does that mean we're done? Now that Glacier is the owner of C3, does that mean we pierce? No, there's more to it than that. This is where the trial court got it wrong. The trial court found that he was an equitable owner and stopped there. The appellate court reminds us that now we've determined who the owner is, now we have to see whether or not we pierce. And under New York law, which this is tried under, to pierce the corporate veil, a plaintiff must prove three things, very similar to our other tests. One, that the owner has exercised control such that the corporation is a mere instrumentality of the owner. The owner is the real actor. The corporation does not have its own separate existence. It's simply the owner in another form. And 
such control was used to commit fraud or wrong, and the fraud or wrong is the proximate cause of an unjust loss or injury. So the trial court got it wrong in two different ways. One, they didn't even apply what amounts to the alter ego doctrine. And two, they didn't understand all the elements there. There are three steps in the alter ego doctrine. One, we have the idea of domination, control. That's the alter ego part, but that domination or control must be used to, to do something bad. And that bad thing must be the proximate cause of harm. So here, since Glazier exercised considerable authority to the corporation, he disregarded the form and acted if the assets were his to manage and distribute, it was appropriate to view him as its equitable owner. His obligations encompassed the entire business, and after C3 entered into the agreement with Thompson, all the taxes, all the expenses, all the salaries were paid to Glazier, and C3's bank account had only $10,000 in it. All right, look at, he, he was, you, this, picture this as a siphon. He's siphoning off the corporate assets, right? This is the valuable relationship, and he's taking it for himself. So clearly, equitable ownership is fine, but the element of control was not sufficient to justify veil piercing. Why? All three elements need to be met in order to pierce the corporate veil. So the circuit judge, Minor, remanded the issue to the trial court as to whether Glazier used his control to commit a fraud or wrongdoing, and whether that fraud or wrongdoing was the proximate cause of the injury to Freeman. Now there was a dissent here, but it was kind of an unusual dissent. It was actually a dissent that was even more favorable. It went even further in that direction. See, judge Godbold concurred in affirming that Glazier totally controlled C3. But he actually said remand is not necessary. What is the purpose of remand? Why do we remand things? What happens upon remand, Brett? Uh, well, let me ask a different. What do trial courts do that appellate courts do not do? Uh, determine, facts. determine facts. They determine facts. And so remand is a fact finding. The, the concurring in part, dissenting in part, Judge Godbold said, we don't need any more facts. Look at these facts. These are terrible facts for Glazier. We don't need any new facts. We can go ahead and decide this case on the record in front of us. On remand, the district court, in fact, did find that the actions were fraudulent and wrongful, and they proximately caused Freeman's harm. However, the upshot of this was that it needed to be arbitrated, okay? So it goes back to arbitration. We can assume who's going to win that one. So in a, in a nutshell, the C3 case brings up two things. One is the doctrine of equitable ownership, which you haven't seen before. But a person can be like a shareholder and treated as a shareholder in certain circumstances. And so the case of C3, uh, complex computing company, explains the doctrine of equitable ownership. Glazier here was an equitable owner. But it also reminds us that the alter ego doctrine, you need to meet all three elements. Okay. There has to be this sort of domination control. The domination and control has to be used fraudulently. And that fraudulent usage has to be a proximate cause of harm. We need to show all three of those things in order to pierce. Any questions on C3 before we look at the barge? The barge? Anybody? Bueller? Darbro. I'm called Darbro. I can pronounce Darbro. Okay. So seeing no questions, let's talk about Darbro, and, and then we're going to have some questions to discuss about why do these cases come out differently. So in this case, over here, Thomas and Robert the barge sold real estate properties to the Warden Group. So here's the properties. They sold it for $900 in cash. And the Warden Group didn't have enough to pay them the whole thing, so the Warden Group wrote them a note, a promissory note. It basically said, uh, this is a debt, we're going to pay you $180 back. It didn't seem like there was any interest on the note, but it was an IOU, just a person-to-person -person IOU. Now, after that transaction was consummated, and now the Warden Group owns the property, the, the barges are still out $180. Bucks. They're still waiting for $180 to come through. So they're not, they're not fully paid. That's why they're still part of the picture here. 
And then the warden group, I guess they didn't really like these houses, so they decided to sell it to somebody else. Now, first, they try to sell it to uh, A and M, which was Albert and Mitchell Small. So the Smalls own a company called Darboro, and there, I guess, was some discussion the Smalls would purchase this personally, but they decided that wasn't so smart. It would be smarter to do a real estate deal through a corporate entity. Because why? They wanted a liability shield. They wanted to protect themselves from the debts of their company. And so they formed a corporation. And this corporation was called Horton Street Associates. So Horton and Darboro had the same ownership, the Smalls. And that's how Darboro gets pulled into this as well. So this transaction is $840 in cash, which was paid from a mortgage. So Ford Street owes the bank some money, but we don't care about that over on this side. We've got our $840, right? So we don't care that the bank might get stuck or not. Now, they also assume the note. So that note is still outstanding. So that the barges are now owed $180 by HSA for this note. And they wrote another note for $20,000. The lenders uh, to Horton Street received guarantees. So this mortgage was guaranteed by the Smalls, but this note was not. Right? And as I mentioned, this mortgage is irrelevant. It's in parentheses, irrelevant for our purposes here. It, it was like cash to our, our plaintiffs. But the note, the note, this was not as good as cash. The note, the note is, <laughs> it's not cash. It's a promise, it's an IOU. So, after the purchase, the real estate market started to deteriorate. Oh, it, was 2000, it was 1996. And, and began to lose money. And the Smalls and Darbro, which is, again, they get drawn in this. They loan money. They loan $225,000 to Horton Street. Now, it's not a gift. It's a loan. And it's obviously not an arm's length transaction, but it's, it does show some uh, amount of connection between these entities, which are obviously connected. I mean, they share a common ownership. But that wasn't enough. The $225,000 loan was not enough to keep the company afloat. And uh, they tried to renegotiate, but in any event, uh, the, they were unable to pay and service this, this debt. And so the, the barges and the warden group brought an action to recover a balance on this note. Now, HSA doesn't have the money to pay the note, but I guess the Smalls and Darboro did. So the question is, do the Smalls and Darboro have to pay the $180,000 note? Well, the only reason they'd have to do so is if we pierce. Are we going to pierce the corporate veil on Horton Street up to the Smalls or and or across the corporate groups to Darboro Right, so remember, that's alter ego and enterprise liability. We learned about that last time when we talked about torts. This is like the case of the taxi company that had, or the, the, the nine taxi companies that had one owner, Carlton. Here, the Smalls own several companies. And so we have an enterprise liability theory as well as an alter ego theory. We're going to try to pierce sideways and up. So initially, a default judgment against Horton Street was issued, and a second action was then... So the Horton Street basically didn't show up in court. So that's step one. So they say, pay us a note, and they say, well, nothing. They didn't show up, and so they lose. They probably had no money. It wasn't even worth fighting. They obviously owe the money. They're going to lose anyway, so they, they take the default judgment. A second action was then initiated against Darbro and the Smalls personally for the remaining balance unpaid. And the theory was that... Uh, Horton Street was the alter ego of Darboro and the Smalls, although enterprise liability would have been a better theory for Darboro. Now, the trial court concluded that D the Darboro and the Smalls were liable to the Warden Group and the fee barges for the outstanding balance. In other words, the trial court said, yeah, go ahead and pierce. But did that verdict hold? What happened at appeal? At appeal, this was reversed. 
Why did the appellate court reverse and say the trial court erred in piercing? Because the evidence was insufficient to justify piercing here. Justice Glassman found that a corporation's legal entity should be discarded only when necessary for the interest of justice and with caution, applying a very stringent standard, reminding us that piercing is exceptional. And a party is generally presumed to be insulated from liability when another party enters into a, a contractual relationship with them. We need something more. We need what we might call plus factors. Were those factors here? Right? Well, it was a closely held or even a two-person two held, almost sole shareholder, so we kind of meet the sniff test of something that could go farther. Was there misrepresentation? There was no misrepresentation here. The court says that there was some sharp business tactics and shrewd dealing, but these are big boys and big girls. They know about corporate law. They understand that there's a limited liability shield. They originally were going to sell to the Smalls, but they agreed to sell to Horton Street Associates, and they know the difference. The trial court also determined that the Smalls did not, as a matter of fact, personally guarantee that loan, and that the, the barges were sophisticated real estate professionals, so they can protect themselves. There was no evidence of commingling assets. There was no evidence of failing to, fo to follow cor corporate formalities. Now, undercapitalization, let's talk about that for a second. Do you, do you think that, that the company was undercapitalized? What evidence would say that the company was not undercapitalized? What does it mean to be undercapitalized? Well, yeah, Brett. Well, be undercapitalized means they aren't you know, holding money in it to cover their liabilities. I mean, they took in a $225,000 loan to try and cover their liabilities, but they, they continue to pay. So therefore, I mean, you don't just keep pumping money into a failing business. There's no obligation to keep pumping money into a failing business. Just look at the direction of this arrow. That's a big number going this way into the company. Right, what was the issue here? Where was the money going here? The money was going out. Here the money is going in. How could you say that's under, they put 225,000 more dollars to keep the company afloat. There's no obligation to keep a failing business intact forever. If there were, what's limited liability? Right, it eviscerates the meaning of it. So why do these cases come out differently? Thoughts? What are some distinctions we can make between the case of C3 and the case of Darborough? Well, one is the direction of the money, right? And that's an important one. We don't have any evidence of undercapitalization. We also don't have any evidence of domination and control. They're not running this company. Essentially, this is an, this is an independent contractor. This company does nothing without Glazier. Its entire purpose is a vehicle for him to provide his consulting service, consulting. You ever met a consultant? What do they do? They consult, huh? It's vague, right? Whereas a real estate holding company is something a little bit more clear. So Glacier is actually running C3, and he's doing it in this convoluted way to avoid some roadblocks that were put up, whereas Horton Street Associates is exactly how you'd expect a real estate holding company to be structured. C3 was really a shell. In fact, Glacier Inc. was a shell. None of these had any significance or economic reality or any purpose outside of a convoluted structure in order to get a license to allow Glacier to run his business for his own profit. Here, a real estate holding company, what they're putting money into, they're loaning, where, where this company, this company is significant enough, it's getting a bank mortgage. A bank lent $840,000 to this company. So there's evidence that this is a real entity here. So, what about the wrongdoing? Well, this is a closer issue. On the one hand, we don't know what these practices were. The court characterizes the practices in Darbro as sharp and shrewd, but not wrongful. On the other hand, we know that this guy was scheming. What is the difference between something that is sharp business practices and shrewdness versus <laughs> acting wrongfully? It's a matter of judgment. These cases are actually closer than they may seem. Obviously, the trial court found that we could pierce here. So 
upshot from this, all right, going back to our, our piercing factors. So when will we pierce? Well, first off, if it's a public company, we never pierce. We see that in the cases that we have piercing or something close to piercing, usually it's a single shareholder, sometimes it's two, occasionally it's three. Next, it seems to have some difference in what type of, uh, at least the, we have to at least explain why torts and contracts are different. Uh, Professor Thompson found that courts pierce in 42% of contract cases and only 31% of tort cases. Professor O oh thought it was closer. What's the, what's the difference? Well, courts may be changing how they feel about protecting tort claimants and companies abusing the corporate veil. Having a sole shareholder, that's a big plus factor. Dominating and controlling. Every case that we see with piercing, there's some element of domination and control. It's part of the alter ego theory. Failure of formalities, well, we don't know that there was a failure of formalities here, but the other facts overcame it. He was using the corporate structure uh, in order to get around uh, Columbia University's rules. Inadequate capitalization seems to be an issue here in C3, where he was withdrawing money, 10,000 is not enough. Here it's hard to say, the company in hindsight was inadequately capitalized, but why? Because it actually was a failing asset, not because they were withdrawing funds from it. There didn't seem to be any misrepresentation here. Here, Daniel Freeman looks like he was lied to, right? treated wrongfully. And there were personal guarantees in this case, in the case of Darborough, but they applied to the mortgage, which was not pertinent in this case. There are no personal guarantees about repaying the note. So, factors. What is the most important factor? Probably misrepresentation. Basically, courts are saying, if you lie, if you use the corporation to lie, we're not going to give you limited liability. Abuse of the corporate form seems to be next, treating the corporation as it's really your own. We're not going to give you the benefit of the corporation if you're going to take advantage of it. We're only going to let you use corporations for their intended purpose. And so that's piercing in contracts cases. Now, our last section that will be piercing in corporate groups. So let's take a look at that. And I'm sorry, but I have a sad story to tell you. A story of a young couple on their honeymoon with an unfortunate event. By the way, um, I'll tell you how you know you're in a good relationship is when you try to rickroll your fiance and she says, that was so sweet. <laughs> you know what a rickroll is when you, when you send someone that video? I thought this was funny, so I was gonna rickroll my fiance, so I sent her a text with like, you know, you kind of hide the message, like, this is really important, click here. And it was, uh, you know, never gonna give you up song. And she, she was like, that is so sweet, honey. I'm like, totally rickroll. Oh, come on. She, so it was like, so they were probably, th th this couple was in that sort of, I'm sure, relationship on their honeymoon here and, and terrible, terrible result. So we can feel for them. Unfortunately, bail piercing wasn't the answer to their problems. So before we get to what happened in this case here, what is a corporate group? Well, I've, driven, I've drew, drawn some, some illustrations here, but essentially it's when one corporation owns stock in another. For example, a parent is a company that owns the stock of another corporation. The subsidiary is the corporation it owns. And a parent can, be, uh, can have a wholly owned subsidiary, meaning it owns 100%, or, or a partially owned subsidiary, less than 100%. You should be familiar with those terms. Uh, an affiliate is going to be something more parallel. Right? So this would be an affiliate type of relationship, although there's no ownership. It's turned out to matter here, but kind of on the same level. So an affiliate would be enterprise liability, and an owner would be alter ego. And so our same doctrines apply. Are courts more or less willing to pierce to get to a parent corporation's asset? That's what we'll address in these cases. So um, Lisa Gardemal sued the Weston Hotel Company in Weston, Mexico, under Texas law, alleging that they were liable for the drowning death of her husband. This is in 1999, and so I don't think YouTube or Rick Rolling existed yet. But Cabo San Lucas did. I hear it's a lovely place. <laughs> in fact, I'd love to go to Cabo. 
one of these days. But, but the problem with Cabo is that um, I guess it has a couple beaches that have, let's say, like misleading names. So there's one beach called Lover's Beach. Sounds like a great place for a newlywed couple to spend some time that has deadly undertow. And, and uh, what question? No. <laughs> yeah, 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 not a great name, right? Lover's Beach, and it will cause you to get sucked into the undercurrent and swept away, which is exactly what happens. So the Gardamels want to go snorkeling with some of their other guests and their friends. They go to the hotel, they ask the concierge, what's a good place to snorkel? And the concierge says, you should totally go to Lover's Beach, it's beautiful. Unfortunately, it was notorious for rough surf and strong undercurrents. Five men in the group were swept into the ocean, thrown against the rocks, and two of the men, including Dr. John Gardamel, died. So this is like really bad advice, you know. You, like, you go to New York and you say, what's the best Chinese restaurant around here? And, you know, it's like got a C health grade. Like, that's, that's bad. This is worse. You know, don't go to Lover's Beach, don't listen to concierge. And so, well, first off, why, do we even, why are we even implicating a corporation here where well, we talked about respondeat superior? Right? And under this doctrine, the employer is liable for the actions of the employee. There's no question here that the employer is liable for the action of the, of the employee. Right? There's a full-time employee. He sits at the front desk. He has a little badge that says concierge, little brochures, visit Lover's Beach, you know, rent the snorkeling equipment. Here's where you can get a casket. And, and so there's just, there's no doubt at all that this concierge is an employee and therefore the employer is responsible for the death. And of course, it's a tragic thing, but what is, what is the, the widow uh, uh, going to do about this? She's going to sue Weston Mexico and Weston International. Why do you think she's doing that, just by the way? Why wouldn't you just sue Weston Regina? and its owner, DTI. Any ideas? Uh, more, money. more money, right? That's a good start. She probably figures that's how she'll get more money. That's usually a good reason to sue one person or another. And I guess she had an attorney who didn't take this class and who thought, sure, we're just going to go after the biggest fish in the pond. Pun intended. So. The question here is, could Wesson be liable on the theory that Wesson, Mexico function as an alter ego of Weston Regina, and for that matter, uh, that effectively, we're, we're, we're trying to connect a lot of dots here, which is why it doesn't work, that Wesson Regina, which is managed by Wesson, Mexico, which is owned by Wesson International, that Wesson International treats Wesson Regina as its alter ego. We'll see a case where that's true, but spoiler alert, it didn't work here. It was a pretty bad theory, especially because there seems to be a pretty easy case for recovery here. I mean, the concierge sent this guy snorkeling at a deadly location, and he's clearly an employee. Why not go there? It could also have to do with the procedural posture of lawsuits in Mexico. I mean, that would have been under Mexican law. So you have a Mexican company, a tort that occurs in Mexico. I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say sure. I'm 95% sure that Juries in America grant larger awards for wrongful death than they do in Mexico, so that may be part of it, as well as the deeper pockets. So we have to ask two questions. First, was Weston an alter ego? And was this a single business enterprise? So first, the alter ego theory would allow the imposition of liability on a corporation for acts of another corporation when the subsidiary is a mere tool or business conduit for the parent. Remember, this is a vertical doctrine. And the alter ego would be demonstrated by blending of identi identities, blurring the line between the two companies. In a way, alter ego is easier to prove in corporations than in human beings because the corporation really can function as one entity because the corporation does not necessarily have to have its own space, its own staff, its own finances. It might have separate bank accounts. We'll see that in the next case. Alter ego is demonstrated by a blurring of these identities. And it also has to, it also asks similar questions. In addition to blurring of identities, which sounds a lot like domination and control and commingling assets, we also would look at undercapitalization and failure to observe formalities. So the circuit judge found that the record revealed nothing special here. This was a typical relationship. 
In fact, Western International and Western Mexico had different staff, had different offices, had different business practice, had different employee handbooks, had different management. Weston didn't dominate Weston, Mexico. The opposite, if anything, was true. The facts weighed heavily against Gardamal here. Right? And, and we need something more. We need plus factors. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I really feel for it, right? I mean, this is a terrible situation. We want recovery, but this is not the way to get it. If Western Regina was undercapitalized, maybe. Okay, so how about the single business enterprise theory? This doctrine provides that when corporations are not operated as single entities, but they integrate their resources to achieve a common purpose. And that might have been found here. Maybe Western Mexico really didn't do anything except manage Western Regina. Now that's possible. It's possible that this was the only hotel in Mexico, the only Western in Mexico, and maybe all of the staff of Western Mexico were at the Western Regina. Maybe they had their corporate headquarters in the same building. Maybe they paid people off the same payroll, but that's not true here. There's several Westons in Mexico, not just this one, and the staff were separate. They provided some management oversight. Was there a common business purpose? No, there are diff different business purposes. Western Mexico manages hotels. Western Regina owns and runs them. And in fact, Western Regina is owned by another company, DTI, apparently a Mexican company. So there is just no evidence here. So you go back and look at this case, and, and while we have a sympathetic plaintiff, and I'm not kidding about this, right? Sometimes the sympathetic plaintiff wins the case. We want recovery for Lisa Gardemal. There was clearly wrongdoing. Her husband died because of their negligence. But who's they? Weston Regina. The whole point of corporate liability shields is if you do not commingle assets, if you do not misrepresent, although how do you misrepresent, rep, rep, misrepresent for torts, if you are not draining the assets and causing it to be undercapitalized. Look, they had money, they had insurance, they had staff. This is not that case, but Blimpy was. So, what happened in Blimpy, which I didn't know still existed until I flew through the Omaha airport. It's like, yeah, there's a Blimpy there. And I went to Taco Bell, but anyway. OTR owns a shopping mall and leased space to a company called IBC Services. So here's our lease agreement. IBC Services is owned entirely by Blimpy. It's a wholly owned subsidiary. And what IBC Services does is it gets these leases and it subleases them to franchisees. And so in this case, the franchisee was another corporation called Smyrna Inc which was owned by uh, Sam and his wife, Ishkander. So IBC had one purpose and one purpose in life. Its job was to hold leases, very, to get leases on behalf of franchisees and then sublease to them. That's all it did. And it didn't have any business premises of its own. It didn't have any assets. It didn't have any employees. It didn't have any staff. It didn't have any income other than the rent payments from the franchisees, which were made directly to OTR. Pass through. Money going in, money going out. It has zero dollars, zero office, zero staff. What is the purpose? Liability shield. Right? What does IBC, what does Blimpy want? They want to be able to give their franchisees good lease deals and not be stuck holding the bag. That's a great scheme, except it's illegal and it's violation of corporate law and it won't work. But it's a good thought, Blippi. Good try. Right, so what does that look like? First off, why, why would IBC Services get a better lease than Smyrna? Okay, who here has heard of Smyrna Inc.? Who here has heard of Blimpy? Okay, still not that many. But, <laughs> but more... But more, right? They've got t-shirts, they've got, they used to have, I think, national ad campaigns. And so they walk in the door, and, and not only that, but IBC Services walks in the door wearing blimpy shirts. You can, can you picture it? it's green, like kind of a yellow logo, like circular, kind of sub, roughly sub-shaped, kind of reminiscent of like lettuce and, and a bun. And so they're wearing these blimpy shirts looking like they're purveyors of sub, submarine sandwiches and they walk into OTR's office and they lead them to believe 
that they're acting on behalf of Blimpy, that they're from Blimpy Corporate, and in fact they were. Remember, IBC Services had no employees of their own. So these guys actually were on the Blimpy payroll. They were wearing their Blimpy shirts. They were receiving their Blimpy 401k. So what result here? Do we pierce? Yes, finally we pierce. We have enough facts. We have something much more. The plaintiff is not as sympathetic. It's just a shopping mall. But the use of the corporation here was a scheme, a scam, a fraud. And there was misrepresentation. So let's go through the factors here. First off, ownership and control. Was IBC Services effectively the alter ego of Blimpy? Yes, it was. It had none of its own employees, none of its own offices, none of its own finances, right? none of its own t-shirts. They wore the Blimpy t-shirts for crying out loud. Right? But control alone is not enough. That's the first of the three factors. What are the other two? Two, they used this to commit a fraud or injustice. Some improper purpose. Well, did that happen here? <coughs> yeah. OTR testified they thought they were dealing with Blimpy directly. And IBC never expressly stated that, but it led OTR to believe it was Blimpy. For example, as I mentioned, the people who went to make the inquiry were wearing, oh, both Blimpy, Blimpy uniforms. I guess they were wearing the Blimpy shirt and the Blimpy hat, right? Maybe they have Blimpy shoes on, had little sub-shaped shoes. In addition, the lease stated that IBC's address was the same address as International Blimpy Company. All of this would lead a reasonable person to believe they're dealing with the International Blimpy Company. Now, yeah, I'll give you guys a lease. You make subs, and you have assets, and you have franchisees, right? You're a safe bet. Probably give them a lease at a better rate. You're always going to give someone who's less risky a better rate than someone who's more risky. There's just a price of that risk. We've never heard of Smyrna, however you pronounce it, so we're going to give them a crappy rate because they may not pay, and they didn't. We're going to give Blimpy a better rate because we feel more sure that they pay and that we have some recourse. So uh, Blimpy comes up with this great idea. Well, let's have our cake and eat it too. Right? Let's set up this subsidiary, which will block our liability, while at the same time pretending that they have assets, that pretending that they're us. Yeah, that's not going to work. The court rejected Blimpy's argument that it observed all the corporate formalities, and so it should be entitled to the benefits. All right, that's our last factor. They didn't fail to follow corporate formalities. They did misrepresent. They did commingle assets. They were undercapitalized, but they documented it. Yeah, that's not enough. That's not enough. Misrepresentation alone would probably be enough. The court said the separate corporate shell created by Blimpy to avoid liability may have been mechanically impeccable. But in every functional and operational sense, the subsidiary had no separate identity. It was moreover not intended to shield the parent from responsibility for its subsidiary's obligation, but to shield the parent from its own obligations. Right? It was not intended to shield the parent from its subsidiary's obligations. That's normal. It was intended to shield the parent from its own obligations. It, it wanted to give its franchisees cheap leases and it did not want to guarantee them. Not okay. That is an evasion and an improper purpose fraudulently conceived and executed. And so here again, like C3, we have clear cut case for Pearson. So can you distinguish the cases? Yeah. On the one hand, a concierge at the Western Regina gives some really crap advice to go snorkel in a deadly area, and someone dies, which is terrible. And the recourse goes to the Weston. Do we then bring Weston Mexico and Weston International into that story? No. No, this was a typical parent subsidiary relationship. And unless the Weston Mexico is siphoning away the Regina's assets or maintaining similar properties or otherwise misrepresenting that they're one and the same when they're not, on the other hand, in OTR Associates, a shopping mall lease space to a Blimpy subsidiary who then sublease it to a franchisee who then failed to pay the lease. And by the way, a sublease means that the original lessor is still on the hook. You know there's the difference between a, a sublease and an assignment, right? In an assignment, the liability is cut off. 
But in a sublease, both parties remain liable. Both the original lessor and the sub lessor are joined and subly liable for paying on the lease. And so assume, I assume that OTR was not comfortable with an assign, the ability to assign the lease. They probably said, no, we, we want Blimpy to pay the bill if these franchisees don't. This was evasion fraudulently carried out. Is the difference between contracts and torts? This is a contract, this is a tort. Is that the difference? No, probably not. We have way more factors than that here. So I do put contract and tort piercing something to think about. That balance has changed somewhat over time. Now it's not even entirely clear that the piercing is that out of balance. What we're really looking for is misrepresentation first. Well, first, actually, first and foremost, we're looking at if the corporation is closely held or solely held. If the corporation is widely held, we're simply not going to find the kind of domination and control. I mean, think about it this way. Even if this number of people, everyone in this classroom, 20-some of you, right, got together and formed a corporation, would you always be able to agree on it completely in a way that your collective ideas would dominate and control it? No. I mean, there's not going to be a situation where 20 people always agree on anything. How about a million shareholders? It's never going to happen. You're not going to have that alter ego. I mean, there is no, well, there's several egos here probably, mine most of all, but, but there's separate egos. There's not one, you know, class, you know, class ego here that could control. So likewise with a widely held corporation. The second is going to be whether or not there was misrepresentation because courts are really going to get you if you've committed fraud. And that comes out in OTR Associates and in C3. Next, we're going to look at whether there is going to be some type of uh, uh, commingling of assets where you're treating the corporation, you're disrespecting the corporation's separate identity and treating it like it's not one. Why should you get the benefit of treating the corporation like your own piggy bank and others have to respect its separate liability? Similarly, not as bad, but similarly, if you're draining money from the company on purpose, knowing that it won't be able to pay its debts so that you can enrich your pockets, well, that's very similar to commingling assets, and it's going to get you pierced. And then finally, failing to fa follow uh, formalities. But remember, why does failing to follow formalities rarely itself cause piercing? What are the three elements of the alter ego doctrine? So let's say that there is a failure to follow formalities. How would that failure to formalities cause harm? Remember, the second element, right? The particular action, the wrong action, has to actually cause harm, has to be the proximate cause of some actual harm. It's not as likely that simply failing to follow corporate formalities itself is going to cause the type of harm that will lead to piercing. Okay, so you didn't follow, you didn't, you didn't have a, a meeting, you didn't have quorum at the meeting, or the meeting wasn't documented properly. Sure. But what was really going on? Was it a misrepresentation? Why does this party harm? Why is this party unable to collect under the contract? So it's probably not going to be enough. Deception by insiders uh, is, is much more decisive. And the other factor which sort of goes on to here is, I think, as we saw in Darbro, did the other party have a way to protect itself? We're going to be less likely to pierce when the plaintiff is sophisticated and had some other way of protecting themselves. So in the case of Darbro, what did that look like? It looked like a really sophisticated seller who didn't get personal guarantees. They had that option. Other investors got personal guarantees. They didn't negotiate for it. Maybe they would have got a lower sale value with personal guarantees. Maybe they had to sell to somebody else. Maybe they have to hold the property a little longer. But they knew what they were doing, and they didn't do it. Any questions on piercing the corporate veil? So this is a very frequently tested topic, and you should be prepared to address it on the bar exam, and for that matter, on my exam. So key takeaways here. right? The first element of the alter ego doctrine relates back to the factors. So whether or not we have domination and control, that first aspect here has to do with whether or not the governance structure would permit it. Right? On the one hand, a sole shareholder could very well dominate and control a company. A million shareholders in Microsoft, not going to dominate and control. And then we need to find some harm. Right? Whether that harm is caused by m misrepresentation, 
commingling of assets, undercapitalization, those are all things that can result in harm to a tort or a contract party because there's not money to pay for the tort claim, not money to pay under the contract. We have to have that harm, and that harm has to be caused by the domination and control. So it's a three-factor test. We haven't seen a case where we've pierced for enterprise liability, you know, across, and what you can take away from that is it is even less common because under what circumstance would one entity control the other? Right, so we didn't see that case. We saw cases where that wasn't going to happen, right, in the case of Carlton. Um, I don't think I have really much else on this. Yeah, any, any questions then? Yeah. Yes. It's yeah, just a question of, of the direction. I have a couple. The enterprise liability doctrine is not going to come up as often, uh, but let me flip to a couple notes on that here. So the court in Walkowski made the following statement. It is one thing to assert that a corporation is a fragment of a larger corporate combine which actually conducts the business. Effectively, what that's saying is that you may have five subsidiaries, but because they're all dominated by the parent, they're all liable. We'll pierce through all of them because really this is one thing. But we need to find that there was, we still need to find there was some domination and control. What we find here is there's domination and control of S1 and, let's say, and the other entities. So it's actually harder to prove. It begins with really finding that there was some alter ego. And in fact, all of these were effectively one ego, if you will, that there is some larger corporate combine. We didn't see that case presented here. It's less, much less common. So if a, subsi a subsidiary could theoretically control another, and that would that would create enterprise liability. So sorry, I didn't get your quick okay. right. But there could be there could be some control here. I mean, usually that would happen through the parent, yeah. right? Who's going to siphon money from S1 to S2 or something like that. But we do see structures that. I mean, this is assuming that this is like a real structure. We also saw C3 computing, where there was some weird contractual relationship where an independent contractor was really the de facto owner of an entire corporate entity. And so it's possible that S2 is really the de facto owner. And we'd have to get to that, though, with some kind of uh, equitable ownership. Uh, and so we don't, we don't see that. We don't see that here. Um, enterprise liability against corporations... Uh, would expand the assets, but only when those corporations are operated as a single economic unit, right? And so we're looking for really that alter ego writ large. I suppose, like you said, it's possible that these are all operated as a single unit, and so we'll disregard the shield between them. But that means that there is some puppet master controlling all those strings. Other questions? So you should be prepared to go, I mean, really at the end of the day, um, it's a three-factor test, right? The alter ego doctrine is a three-factor test for piercing up to the parent. And it really focuses primarily on four factors to the first one. So under the first factor of the three-factor test, we have four uh, plus factors. We have, well, again, like I keep not even calling it a factor because it's so vital to have some type of very closely held company, either solely held, or one or, may, or two or maybe three shareholders. By the time you get to four or five shareholders, the percent of piercing drops to single digits. And so that's almost like a limiting factor. But then we look for misrepresentation, we look for uh, commingling assets, undercapitalization, which is like commingling assets, but not quite as egregious, right? Sort of taking assets legally and with procedure and then failing to follow procedure. But note that you don't have to meet all four. In fact, we have at least one case where formalities were followed and piercing happened anyway. Uh, let's go back to make sure there's nothing else. Um, 
We talked about comparing this to other creditor protections, and so one of the reasons that we do pierce is when there are no alternatives to protection. And so we're going to be more likely to pierce as well, where we do not have the ability to make personal guarantees or where someone's not as sophisticated, um, where there's a power asymmetry, a bargaining asymmetry. So this is a multi-factor test, uh, and you can feel free to look at all the facts and circumstances. Remember that it's an equitable doctrine, not a legal doctrine. So courts apply equitable doctrines more flexibly when justice so requires. So absolutely deal with the factors presented, but especially on the bar exam where examiners like to throw you more curveballs, you definitely want to look at what are some other plus factors you can mention, right? right? Is someone at an unfair advantage in the, in the contracting process, right? And you might bring up that at least theoretically, it doesn't seem to bear out, but at least theoretically, involuntary claimants, tort claimants, should have a little more access for piercing because they are not able to bargain and to protect themselves against the corporate form. The problem with that is that the number one factor is misrepresentation and there's, it doesn't really, there's no way to misrepresent a tort. Right? As I said, like no one's saying, I promise to run you over with a cement truck and you really only hit them with the Toyota Camry. And that's not, that's not how torts work. Torts are involuntary and so there's not a misrepresentation ahead of time that leads to the harm. The harm is the result of being unable to pay for the tort that was committed. Any other questions? All right, so that's it for today.